Hello and welcome to another episode of The Mark Moss Show. And today I want to talk about being an intelligent investor. Now we talk about uh, money and freedom. We talk about building wealth so you can yeah, build your freedom, build optionality, secure your future. And today I want to talk about specifically investing education. And I want to talk about some mental models that we have. And I want to get it from... Well, I, I, I pull a lot from good old Uncle Warren Buffett, but today we're going to pull from Warren Buffett's mentor, and I'm talking about Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham wrote a book called The Intelligent Investor, and if you want to be a more intelligent investor, you should go read the book. Now, it's an old book, um, but there is still so much truth to it today, and that's why I've read it. Uh, I continue to go back to it and pull information from it. Uh, it helps me build mental models, mental frameworks. Um, that I think are super timeless and important, and I think that you should as well. And I'm going to pull out six today that I'm going to share with you that help me uh, think about the world, help me to become a better investor, have helped me to build uh, multiple eight-figure um, portfolios, and they can help you as well. So uh, let's run through some of these. Now, the first one is that price is what you pay and value is what you get. Now, what would you say if I had this backpack right here and I wanted to sell you this backpack for $200? Well, if you're answering that question in your head, you would probably go, why the heck would I buy a backpack from you for $200 when I could just go online and buy one for $50? Did you think that? If so, you're thinking, unfortunately, like a non-intelligent investor. You see, you thought about the price of the backpack. I said it was $200. You thought the price of $200 sounded too expensive, and you could go get a backpack for a lower price of only $50. Price is what you pay, but value is what you get. So to become an intelligent investor, you must think about the value. So what I would ask is, what type of backpack is it? Is it a designer backpack? What is the backpack made out of? I might ask, what else I get with the backpack. Um, if I buy the backpack, do I get access to some special club? Do I get to go to some special event? I might ask what's inside the backpack. What's in the backpack? Is there a gold bar? Is there a Bitcoin wallet with a bunch of Bitcoin on it? Um, is there a phone with you know celebrities' contacts in there? What else do I get in the backpack? Do I get with the backpack? What's the backpack made out of? I want to understand the value because... I might want to pay 200 200 might be a bargain. If I said, hey, I have this used car. It's a couple years old. Um, I'll sell it to you for $100,000. You're like, what? Why would I buy a used car that's a couple years old for $100,000? Well, what if it was like a Bugatti or some rare Lamborghini or Ferrari? And so price is what you pay, but the value is what you get. And so how do we translate that into investing? So as an investor, most times looking at the price of stocks or Bitcoin or whatever it is, you're looking at the price. Oh, the price of Tesla stock, the price of this company, the price of Bitcoin seems expensive. The price is expensive, but we need to look past the price and understand the value, the value proposition. So, for example, Warren Buffett, intelligent investor, looks at the, the, what the company is doing, how much value they're providing to the marketplace, how much profit they're generating, and how much growth and profit this company could generate and return over a long period of time. Now, he doesn't like Bitcoin. He doesn't like gold either. He doesn't like gold because gold doesn't produce anything, and neither does Bitcoin. So he doesn't like it because he doesn't uh, necessarily not, not know about it. He doesn't like it because it doesn't fit his deal box. It doesn't produce income. But the way that I would look at gold or Bitcoin uh, specifically is that Bitcoin provides massive amounts of value. It allows you to custody assets without um, an intermediary. It allows you to send money peer to peer without a third party. It's helping people um, ensure their freedom. So if you live in Afghanistan or North Korea where you're not able to send money, um, it allows you to do that. So there's massive amounts of value. Now, we know it's also disrupting lots of markets, particularly right now we're seeing it disrupt uh, the payment industry, which is pretty big. But more importantly, the, the store of value assets, which are if we just break those store of value assets down, things like bonds, uh, gold, offshore bank accounts, 
uh, some real estate. These are things that people buy to store their wealth, store value assets. There's about 750 trillion there. And so if it can disrupt, if it could take two, three, four percent of those market share, then it could easily have, be worth more. We could see Bitcoin at worth one million per coin. So rather than look at the price, is it expensive or cheap today? We can look at the value that it returns. Another one that I want to dig into is um, in the book, Intelligent Investor, he talks about thinking on the long run. And unfortunately, what we see, I think one of the biggest problems we see with investors today is thinking too short term. How much money can I make by tomorrow or by next week or by next month? But the problem is that over the long run, we see value um, grows and value continues to be provided over a long run, not in a short period of time. Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, says that the big money is not made in the buying and the selling. It's made in the waiting. So what does that mean? It means waiting. It means thinking long term. It means if I wait, if I'm thinking long term, I don't have to rush into something today. I can, if I'm thinking long term, I can wait until the perfect opportunity shows up. I don't need to swing at the first pitch. I'll wait until the perfect pitch, the perfect fat pitch comes in and then I'm going to swing. So waiting one, but also waiting two. Once I've taken that position, once I've moved in, then I have to wait for it to develop. So most people want these massive returns, 100% returns, 1,000% returns you hear about. Uh, I've, uh, I've had 26 um 1,000% returns in the last like six, seven years. But those take time to develop. You need to be extremely early into a market to get them at that cheap. And when you're that extremely early, then you have to wait a long time for that to become a reality. There's lots of positions, a lot, most of those positions, if I would have just... Uh, you know, I could have exited when it was up 100%. I could have exited at 200%. I could have exited at 3, 4, 500%. And that would have been amazing. People would have loved it. It would have been some of the best returns people have seen. But because I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited, sometimes a year or two years, I was able to get to a 1,000% return. So not only do you have to wait for the perfect opportunity, you have to wait for it to materialize. So you have to think long Term. In the book, he says, quote, in the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. All right, the third one, uh, the best investors are learning all the time. So there's a saying that I like to say that, uh, that says that some lessons in life can't be taught, they can only be learned. And that means that, unfortunately, a lot of times we don't learn from reading or watching. Unfortunately, we have to wait until it happens to us, and we have to actually feel the pain. We have to live through that. That's why I like the other saying that says, smooth seas never made a skilled sailor. Unfortunately, most of us have to take, uh, take it on the head. We have to suffer through this, those rough seas to become better skilled. But... We always need to be learning. Best investors are always learning. We always need to learn from our mistakes, or even better, if we can, we need to learn from other people's respect, uh, mistakes. In the book, he says that those who do not remember their past are condemned to repeat it, and you've heard that before. That's why when you watch my videos, you listen to me talk, I reference history almost all the time. I love to find parallels in history so I can get a model of what happened then so I can understand cause and effect of what may happen next. For example, if I touched a hot stove and burned my hand before, I know that if I touch a hot stove again, I'll probably burn my hand again. So when I see a nation that's um, devolving, sort of like we're seeing in the West, when I see a nation that has super high debt, high inflation, um, all I have to do is look back into historical parallels to see what other nations had high debt to GDP levels, what had high um, you know, inflation levels, and then I have to see what happened after that. Did they fall apart? What did that look like? Were they able to pull it off? What did they look like? What did they try? What did they fail with? And then I can just see what we're doing, and then it allows me to draw those parallels, sort of like if I touch a hot stove, I'll burn. So always be learning. Hopefully, if you can, learn from others' mistakes um, and learn from the past so you don't have to repeat those same mistakes. Another nugget that he talks about in the book, Intelligent Investor, is to run your own race. You see, every investor is unique. And so when I get asked all the time, what assets should I buy? What investment should I make? Is this a good investment for me? 
a lot of times I have to respond with, it depends. And people don't like that answer, but it does depend. It depends on lots of things. And back to what um, Benjamin Graham says is you have to run your own race. What's best for me today may not be best for me next year. And what's best for me today may not be and probably isn't best for you either. And so we have to figure out we have to, uh, what our own race is, what makes us unique, and we have to make investment plans that suit our own investment goals, our time horizon, and more importantly, where we're at. You see, we're all going to a different place and starting from a different place. Like, sure, yes, we'd all want to be financially free. I suppose we're all going for that. But what does that even mean to you? Is that... Uh, $5 million in the bank? Is that $5,000 of passive income coming in per month? Like, what does that even mean to you? And then where are you starting from? Do you have 50 million in the bank today? Do you have no money? Do you have a job? Do you have any income? Right. And so we're all starting from a different place. Um, and we all have different time horizons. Like, I don't really plan on retiring. I'm hoping that I'll work till I die because I enjoy what I do. Um, where some of you are like, I need to retire in the next three years because I hate this. Um, so we have different time horizons. But more importantly, it's because we're all unique. So something Warren Buffett got from this is something known as the deal box. Warren Buffett only invests into things that he understands that are in his deal box. Think about if you're watching a baseball game it's a, and, and you have someone at bat and they show like on the screen sort of the strike zone. So he has his strike zone. He has his deal box and he only goes into deals that he understands that fit in that criteria, as do I. I invest into things that I know and I understand. If I don't know and understand them, then there's too much risk for me. All right. It'd be like uh, you live in the Midwest somewhere and I take you to Hawaii where the waves are 30 feet and I take you out to go surfing. You don't know anything about the ocean. You don't know anything about waves, much less those big of waves. It's extremely risky and you could probably die. I've been surfing over there a lot. I'll probably be OK, but it's because I have expertise in that area. Now, you're from the Midwest. Um, you might take me to a rodeo and try and put me onto a bowl. I know nothing about that. So it's probably way too risky for me to do that. But you might be OK with it. And so we need to understand where our competency is, where our area of expertise is, and we should stay within that. Now, you can become an expert in another area if you want to. But what you have to understand, as he says in the book, is that but he, he says that investing isn't about beating others at their game. It's about controlling yourself at your own game. So figure out what your own game is. What game do you want to play? What game can you become an expert in? What are the rules that you'll play that game by? Set those parameters and stay inside those parameters. Do what makes you unique because what's best for me isn't, isn't going to be best for you. Uh, another one of the adages that we get out of the book, um, and this is one that Warren Buffett certainly took to heart. He's famous for saying it, but he talks about uh, Benjamin Graham in The Intelligent Investor says <clears throat> that to be an intelligent investor, you must focus on risk management. The best investors in the world focus on risk management first, and they focus on returns second. Warren Buffett says that the single most important rule with investing is to not lose money. The second most important rule in investing is don't forget number one, which is don't lose money. And what I see from the thousands of comments I get across my social media and all the new investors I get into my financial newsletter I've been writing for the last seven years is they all want to know how much they can make. How much can I make from this one? How, what, what, what position can I buy that will make my money go up the fastest? They're all trying to think about how much they can make instead of protecting their downside. And that's the big, big, big mistake. You must always focus on risk management. As, as Benjamin Graham says, the best investors focus on ma risk management first and return second. You have to understand that lo losses are asymmetric. So what does that mean? If I lose 50% on a certain investment, I have to make back more than 100% in order to get back the 50% I lost. So you probably are aware, uh, making 100% is very difficult. We're, you know, we're seeing the average annual returns of the S&P 500, depending on what time frame you want to look at it, are somewhere in the you know, 7 to 9% range. That's what they return. Ray Dalio, one of the most famous investors uh, in the world, uh, uh, the founder of Bridgewater Capital, largest um, hedge fund in the world, I think has averaged about 11% return in his career. So to make 100% is very difficult, but to lose 50 is pretty easy. And so we don't want to chase that. We need to have proper risk management. 
another one that we saw in the book that I, that really caught my eye, and this is the big one, uh, coming up into holiday season, is that corrections offer opportunities. You want to be buying assets when everyone else is selling them. And going into Black Friday, I think this is interesting because you'll see all over the news people standing in line all night long in order to get in first to a Walmart to get a new TV. They're going to stand outside all night to save a couple hundred bucks on a TV. This is the mentality when things go on sale. But when assets go on sale, financial assets go on sale, stocks, houses, etc., people don't want to touch them. When Bitcoin is at new all-time highs, people I haven't talked to in years are coming out of the woodwork and asking me if it's time to buy when it's at the high. But when Bitcoin makes a low, everybody wants to sell. Everybody wants to run away. Everybody's scared. This is counterintuitive, and it's because of our human emotions. So we want to buy when everyone is selling, and we want to sell when everyone is buying. In the book, he says, the intelligent investor is a realist who sells to optimists and buys from pessimists. So which one are you? Are you an optimist? The glass is half full. Are you a pessimist? The glass is half empty. Or are you a realist? And you just drink the water. And that's what we want to be. We want to be realists. We don't want to be overly optimistic or pessimistic. We want to understand the value. Remember, price is what you pay. Value is what you receive. We need to understand the value of what we're buying. We need to understand where the market cycles are. And we want to buy when there's blood in the street, as, uh, blood in the street, as Mayor Rothschild said. We want to buy when everyone's selling, when things are cheap, when things go on sale. You don't need to wait in line all night at a Walmart, freezing cold, standing up to save 100 bucks. You could just go buy a financial asset on sell and make a lot more. We saw this week that the UK files now reports show that both the left and the right can be targets of censors. Now, I try to not be aligned with the left or the right. You know, I don't know how you view me. Uh, that's fine. I guess if freedom is right wing, I guess I'm right wing. I don't look at it that way. I look at freedom as freedom, not as a political modality. Um, I'm not even sure what left and right are anymore. And I am going to be equally harsh on anybody who wants to censor freedom. And if that happens to be left, then I guess I'm happening to be right. But what I've seen and I've talked about uh, for years now, as a matter of fact, where it really came front and center was probably maybe 2019 I started talking about this, where we saw, uh, I think it was right after Alex Jones got kicked off the face of the internet. And after that, thousands of accounts got censored right after Alex Jones. Now, he was the big name that everybody um, caught on to, but thousands of accounts got shut down right after that. It was like this big sweeping um, change that happened. And I talked about it then, and it wasn't, it was, uh, and I actually had Ben Swan on to talk about that. It's an old podcast. If you want to go back and listen to it, uh, Mark Moss, Ben Swan. Um, and we talked about how people from the left and the right were being censored. And really what it is, is anybody who's not towing the, the mainstream political line, if you will. And so we're seeing this on both sides of the aisle. Like, for example, during the pandemic, doctors were being shut down if they didn't go along with the consensus. Were those doctors right wing or left wing? Well, right. And so like, they want to use these labels. But what we're seeing here, these UK files show that both the left and the right are being targeted by censors. Yes, of course they, they are. Yes, of course they have, because if you don't tow the party line, so which party is the, which, which, uh, which side of the aisle is the party line in? It says here, American audience may struggle with the particulars, but leaked Labor Party documents detail how anti-disinformation can be weaponized in all directions. And so we can see that it doesn't matter, but there's three tactics that they use um, to do this. One, we see accusations of bigotry, homophobia, um, and those are basically used to shut down political po opponents. So these are what we might call like ad hominem attacks. If you say something that I don't like, what I'll do is I'll just uh, attack your character as opposed to trying to actually use an intelligent conversation to debate, debate any of the points that you've made. So you can always tell instantly uh, where the attacker sits on this spectrum by how they reply. So if you see someone put out something factual, I do this all the time. In my videos, I try to put all the what I call receipts on there. So I'm going to show the headlines, the charts, the graphs, and then someone will leave a comment on a video and they'll say, oh, everything you said is wrong. And I'm like, 
everything because I just laid out a whole bunch of facts. If you'd like to, please tell me which one of those I got wrong. I could be wrong. I'm more than happy to go into a conversation and be proven wrong. Sure. I mean, if we can have an intelligent conversation about that, but if you want to go to like, oh, you're just stupid. Oh, you're ugly. You're fat. You're dumb. You're whatever. Like you're, you're a racist. You're a homophobe. Okay. That's not an intelligent conversation. There's no way to win that, but you can automatically tell that the other side doesn't have a good, uh, good um, argument for that. They also use guilt of uh, use of guilt by accusation narratives to attack the reputations of, bo of both conservatives and leftists. Of course, that's the ad hominem. They use close coordination with dependably incurious mainstream media organizations. So this is where they're taking, uh, they're, they're, they're influencing these other organizations to do their bidding for them. So for example, when Russell Brand got accused of old allegations of whatever sexual misappropriation, uh, misappropriations or whatever it was, he hasn't even been charged with anything. There's no, there's no litigation. There's no formal charges that have been filed. He certainly hasn't gone to court and been proven to be guilty. But yet we saw uh, the government in the UK writing letters to platforms such as Rumble asking them to take away his monetization. So now you see the government using platforms like Rumble. They obviously already did with, with YouTube and so forth to do that. Now we can see this uh, many, many times. There's lots of lots of cases of this, but there's only a few reporters that are actually picking this up. We're seeing it b uh, being used against everybody, but they're using it against both sides. And this is why it's important to understand when you think about these types of rules and laws and 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 things that they're putting into place. You have to think about it from both sides. Just because you like it doesn't mean it can't be and probably won't be weaponized against you in the future. Let me give you an example. So I'm a fan of Ron DeSantis. I really like what he did during the pandemic in Florida. I really like how he fought to keep things open. And I've even liked his stance pushing back against mainstream, not just during the pandemic. He's pushed back on ESG. He's pushed back against the Chinese Communist Party. He's done lots of things, but I also have a problem with Ron DeSantis. And the problem is he's sort of like an authoritarian. He's passing lots of new rules and regulations that I like. They align with me. I want someone to stand up and protect these things, but by passing more laws and rules, he's actually limiting what I can do. And once those laws and rules are in place and then Ron DeSantis is out and now you have somebody from the other political party, they could use those same laws and rules against me for things I don't like. And so we have to think through these things better. We have to think through second, third, fourth, fifth order derivatives. derivatives. We have to think, how would I feel if I was on the opposite side of this? Like another example. So he said that uh, he wanted to make it illegal uh, for anyone in Florida to sell land to the, Ch to, to, to the Chinese. Now, I don't want the Chinese Communist Party to come in and buy up all of our land. I don't like that. I don't want them to buy up our farmland. I don't want them to buy up land in their strategic bases like they're doing. And so I don't like that. But I also don't want him to pass a law on what I can do with my private property. So these are sticky issues, and I'm not, I'm not going to spend the time to sit here and debate that, but you have to be able to think through this. And so back to the, the topic at hand and censorship, depending on what side of the aisle you're on, you may want the censorship of that op opposing voice that you're hearing. But if that were to be turned against and used against you, would you like that? And so this is what we're seeing. It's happening to people on both sides of the aisle. And this is why I continue to say that it is not really the left or the right fighting here. It's really we, the people, versus the government. doesn't matter if you're left or right. They're coming for you. Now, we're seeing this is also ramping up. Microsoft and Meta both this week detailed new plans to combat election disinformation. Now, this includes lots of things, including meme stamp style watermarks and, uh, of course, surprise, surprise, a reliance on fact checkers. Now, the interesting thing is that um, people even believe this and even want to go along with this. We saw almost unlimited accounts and examples of these fact checkers being wrong. 
Uh, it's safe and effective, right? All these things we've seen over and over and over again, and they all turned out to be wrong. The, the, you know, the laptop story, all these things. But here they are ramping up again for another election cycle on its way to the United States. And we're seeing that, you know, Microsoft said that they want to come out with new steps to protect elections. But how do you protect an election? An election in a democracy should be from an informed voting base. How can they be informed if they haven't heard both sides of the argument? How can they be informed if they haven't heard the pros and the cons? When I get my uh, voting guide, it has like arguments for and arguments against, and then it has rebuttals to the arguments and for and arguments against. I need to know both sides. In order to take the medicine, I should have informed consent, but if I can't hear about the potential side effects, how can I be informed? You know, your wealth is being silently, secretly siphoned off and stolen from you. And it's being done that way through illegal taxation and not, I'm not talking about the amount of money you send to the IRS. I'm talking about inflation. Inflation is that secret hidden tax because the governments know that they can't just continue to tax us. As a matter of fact, even if they took 100% of all the money of everybody, it wouldn't even come close to paying off the debt. There's just not enough money there. And they're taxing about as much as they can. As a matter of fact, lots of reports have been shown that regardless of what the tax rates are, whether the taxes go up, the percentage of tax they charge you goes up or down, the amount of, the, of revenue the government receives as a percentage of GDP stays about the same. What does that mean? That means that when they take more money away from you, GDP actually goes down and vice versa. Why? Well, it's pretty simple. If they let me keep more money, then what am I going to do? Well, I'm probably going to spend more money, and I'm probably going to invest and grow that money. If they take that money from me, then I can't spend it, and I can't invest it and grow it, and they destroy it. So, of course, as they give us and let us keep more of our money, we spend more. GDP goes up, which is good for everybody, except for the government. Now, think about it like this. If you were able to keep 100% of your income, I guess you'd be free, right? If they take 100 if they take 100% of your income, you're like a slave. What happens when they take 50% of your income? I'll let you think about that. But of course, they can't take more than about 50% of your income because they'll destroy the economy, but more importantly, they're going to have a revolt on their hands. People will not put up with it. So, what do they do? They secretly steal your wealth through inflation. So they just print themselves more money. We can't go out and get more money through tax revenue to fund the government and all these stupid wars and all of these other programs that you don't want or don't like. You're not going to fund that. So what we'll do is we'll just print the money. We'll inflate the monetary supply to do that. The effect, though, is as they print more money, the, the purchasing power, the value of your dollars goes down. That's why it's theft. You had $100,000 in your bank account five, um, three years ago. You still have $100,000 in your bank account today. The problem is it buys you 50% less house and 50% less gas for your car and 50% less food. So even though you still have $100,000, it buys you half of what it used to because they stole secretly the purchasing power out of there. That's why inflation is so bad. Now, big news came out this week. Hooray, hooray, CPI is finally down. It looks like finally the Fed is winning. The Fed has won the war on inflation. Months and months of hotter than expected CPI prints, consumer price inflation and uh, consumer price inflation prints have come out. And now we saw this week the October CPI print came out um, a little bit better than expected. Hooray, hooray, the job is done. Now, year-over-year -year headline is still 3.2%. Core inflation is still 4%, all right? This is not good. If the CPI number, which it has dropped from about 9%, it's dropped from 9 all the way down to 3%, that doesn't mean prices are coming down. That means prices are still going up just a little bit slower than they were before. But this isn't a good thing. As a matter of fact, if you dig into the basket, we have to look at what's going on here. So 
let's break this down. What we can see if we break this down month over month, and we can break it down into all the items in the CPI basket. So we have food, food at home, food away, we have energy, energy commodities, gas, uh, fuel, electricity, utility, we have uh, commodities, less food, we have vehicles, used cars, new cars, apparel, medical costs, services, all those things are in the CPI basket, as they should be, right? they're trying to track how all these things change over time. And we can, and they, and they put these numbers out and we can see them changing month over month. And then we have a year over year. And what we can see is that the reason why the CPI has come down is mostly because of energy. As a matter of fact, fuel, oil is down year over year, 21.4%. Hooray, hooray. So that's good, but that is what's really caused the entire basket to come down. Energy as a whole is down 4.5%, fuel is down 21%, utility, gas service utility is down 15.8%. Used cars and trucks are down 7%, but that's about it. Everything is still up. So food, up 3.3%. You know, the things that you care about, food, transportation, and your house. Those things that you care about are still up. Food, 3.3%. Food away from home, 5.4%. Uh, we have food, less energy, 4%. We have uh, medical care, 4.7% up. Um, and transportation services, 9.2% up year over year. Shelters up 6.7% year over year. So look, don't get misled by these CPI numbers. They are way worse than they look, and they're not going down. Now, why would they be showing us this, for example? So the Fed has been running on a platform to bring inflation down. They have to get that number down. Now, I made a video on my main YouTube channel, just search Mark Moss. I believe it was in January, and I talked about how they're changing the way they calculate the CPI basket and how if they change uh, these changes they are putting in place, if all if, if nothing else happened, but we only use this new calculation, by September and October, we would be down around 3%. And here we have the October reading at 3.2%, exactly what I projected. Now, it's not because I'm some crystal ball. No, it's because I, <laughs> I saw the new projection that they were going to use. So what did they change? So they've typically measured CPI off of a two-year composition, meaning they take the last two years and then measure it to this to now. But what they changed is they decided instead of looking at two years, we're only going to look at a one-year difference. And the reason why that's different is be, uh, makes them such a big difference is because they measure year over year. So if we're up, uh, if we're measuring from a low point, it looks much higher. If we measure from a high point, it looks much lower. And a year ago was the highest inflation we saw. That's where we reached over 9%. So obviously, if you're only going to measure from that one year, you're not averaging out when it's lower. You're only me measuring from the high point of 9%. Obviously, it's going to be lower, which is exactly what we've seen. But again, this is all tricks. It's all, it's all magic tricks. It's all math, if you will. Now, part of what we're seeing is the CPI is magically tracking the M2 money supply. That is the, uh, the supply of the money. Remember, from an Austrian viewpoint, inflation is like a balloon. If you think about a balloon, you inflate a balloon with air. I've increased the capacity or the volume of air inside that balloon. Inflation is the same way when we increase the supply of money. So when M2, so the supply of money goes up, we see CPI inflation go up. CPI today, as we're talking about now, is really measuring prices, consumer price inflation. What happens is when you inflate the money supply, then the prices go up as well. But that's more of the effect of increasing the money supply. So it's not, not, not directly correlated, which is why prices are all over the board. Some prices are higher, some prices are lower, because prices are really set by supply and demand. But what happens is when the money supply goes up, there's more money chasing the limited supply. So the demand goes up when you've increased the money supply. And if the goods don't go up with the amount of demand, then the prices go up. So... That is what's happening, but the Fed wants to declare a big win. I'm an inflation bull. 
I believe this is the lowest inflation we'll see for the, rec for the decade, but it comes in waves. So yes, we've seen some disinflation. We've gone from 9% down to 3% thanks to some smoke and mirrors. I believe it continues to go up higher from here, and then it'll come down again, and then it'll go up again. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show, talking about building and protecting your wealth and your freedom, We're talking about some CPI prints, but that's what we got for today. These are some of the biggest news headlines and what they mean for you so you know what to do next. All right, if you're listening on the podcast app, please like and review this. I'd love it if you could just leave me a review on the podcast. Follow me on social media, Mark Moss, and that's what I got. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.